Now continuing with the rest of our interview, we also have Ronan Haran from the Haifa University. He's an expert on the Auschwitz camp. Hi, thank you for joining us. Welcome. Would you mind, could you please comment a little bit about your research on Auschwitz? I understand that you have a thesis that you're working on. I'm uh, working on a thesis uh, which uh, concentrates on uh, the Zonderkommando uprising that occurred in Auschwitz in October 1944. It seems that uh, the public knowledge knows about it uh, like uh, two tips of an iceberg. One is uprising itself in October 44, and the second is the eventual uh, execution of four women who were charged with um, smuggling gunpowder to the Zonder Commando. Uh, they were executed in January 45. These are the two tips of the iceberg, and when one looks deeper, it seems that there is a lot going before the action and after the uprising until the execution in January. And my aim is to uncover and to write a comprehensive dissertation about what happened behind, this, behind the surface, behind the, the known events. Well, as someone who myself has studied history and people, young people like myself around the world who weren't there during that time, what do you think that we don't know uh, that's not often covered in history books that should be known? Uh, for instance, uh, there was um, an underground activity going on in Auschwitz, uh, in Birkenau, uh, both by uh, Jews and uh, non-Jews, mainly Polish, but other nationalities as well. Uh, there were a book or two written about it, each one from its own point of view, and it seems that uh, we can know more about it by integrating uh, written material with uh, multiple um, testimonies that were given over the years. I see. Well, what was unique about the Auschwitz camp as opposed to other camps? There were several aspects. Uh, main, um, the, ma the main thing was that it, it was a combination of a concentration camp, which was used uh, to utilize manpower of uh, its inmates. And in addition, it was used as an extermination facility, and I call it facility, not a camp. Actually, there were four extermination facilities in Birkenau, where um, over one million Jews were uh, put to death, murdered there. In that sense, it was quite unique relative to other concentration camps, which concentrated on uh, utilizing workforce or death facilities such as uh, Treblinka or Sobibor or Belzitz, which were strictly facilities for death. In that, in that sense, Auschwitz is different. Well, thank you. Uh, I'm also curious, Mr. Haran, your perspective on how the Holocaust is taught in Israel to young people. W what are your thoughts? It seems that the Holocaust is taught with a very strong uh, national theme uh, Professor Timenon mentioned it before, where uh, the, um, the conclusion from the Holocaust, if you like, is that uh, the, the Jews have to be strong in a national way uh, and have, must take care of themselves without relying on any other nation, any other power, uh, because they are uh, almost in always in a danger of a repeated Holocaust. And this message is being uh, uh, repeated, uh, implanted almost, uh, mainly by politicians. Um, and I, fi I find it, um, in, I, I look at it in a negative way. Uh, because I think that the, the true message of the Holocaust is that uh, all human beings should be treated as as the, as the same as well, and nobody should be treated or considered as a sub subhuman related in relation to other. I think this is the main lesson that should be taken from the Holocaust, and unfortunately, this is not what is emphasized here in Israel. I see. Well, you may be familiar, there is this film that recently came out from Alfred Hitchcock. It was never broadcast before, and it showed in detail what happened there, a film that I personally had a very hard time watching. Um, from your own studies, 
how was that possible? How could people be so brutal? And you talked about that, subhuman, how does this relate? I mean, it's hard to comprehend. This is a, <clears throat> the Holocaust seems to be a unique event in history. Um, from what my understanding from my studies is that it stemmed from a fanatical belief on the part of the Nazis uh, that the Jews, as a, as, a, as a whole, as a people, put the Germans in danger, existential danger even. And therefore, they must be annihilated at all costs. Uh, initially, the, the Germans looked for ways to clear the Jews out of Europe, and the physical annihilation was, for them, I would even say a last resort after all other plans had failed and didn't materialize. And they found that physical extermination is the, the almost only possible solution, and it worked very well for them, un unfortunately, of course. Uh, during the Holocaust. I, I am curious, Mr. Haran, what are your most, uh, what, are, what, what haunts you the most about this incident in history? You do study this very closely. What do you think is the core that uh, compels you to keep studying it? Truthfully, the core is emotional rather than rational, uh, because I'm, what is called the part of the second generation of the Holocaust. Namely, my mother was a survivor of the Holocaust. And um, after many years of not dealing with it, I decided that it's time to face the issue, this tough issue, face to face. And therefore, I decided to delve into it and learn and try to understand as much as possible, though it's probably impossible to really understand how it could have happened. But I have some, some cues or uh, points that uh, give me, some, give me some, some explanations to what's going on. I see. Well, you did mention your personal connection. Uh, do you think that other people that have no personal ancestral link to this uh, major human atrocity should or do have an interest in this? And what compels them to study it? I think they should have interest in that, in this, because if you look at a wider perspective, this is a case of a genocide, and genocides are something that happened throughout history and still happening in our times. Uh, so even though the Holocaust is an extreme, in some dimension, an extreme case of genocide, it's definitely not uh, the only one, and uh, one should be at least aware of genocides um, in the hope that by being aware of that, uh, we can find ways to prevent further. I see. Well, continuing on that subject, and I'm actually going to open the question to both of you, what is your take in terms of assimilation, Jewish assimilation with other peoples all over the world? Uh, Jews have gone to all kinds of countries like India, the U.S., Latin America, countries there. Um, how is this assimilation? Uh, affected anti-Semitism? Um, before going into assimilation, I would like to um, add to Professor Zimmerman that being, anti being anti-Semitic, or even if it's anti-Semitism is, is on the rise, there's a huge gap between hating Jews or any other people and taking extreme actions of expulsion or extermination. There's a huge gap between these two. And the, the fact that uh, people, to some extent, are anti-Semitic doesn't mean that the Jews over there are in imminent gen danger. This is not the case. We should make the distinction between danger to, to those being hated and the, the fact that there is hate. Well, speaking on that specifically, I do have here the... Maybe what do you have to say? Maybe economical reasons, unemployment in France versus unemployment here. That might be also a reason. And, the, and because they are Jews, they know that they, in any case they come here, they will be welcomed by the government. So they might come here for the purpose of improving their um, life um, level of living, standard of living. Well, uh... I believe most of the anti-Semitism in 
maybe in general in Europe, but mostly in France, come, f come from Muslim circles rather than Christian circles as before World War II. Uh, in that respect, this is a new kind of anti-Semitism, and it might be connected with the unsolved situation between Israel and uh, its Arab neighbors, Palestinians. And the, the Muslims might feel that they have a, a they feel some kind of comradeship with with Palestinians, uh, just as uh, Israelis feel comradeship with Jews by definition. So that might be a new a new reason for for a new kind of anti-Semitism, very different to, from what was prevailing, and was uh, very to a very large extent in in a French society before the war. Well, there is a strong, from what we sense in terms of media uh, coverage, there seems to be an anti-Arab sentiment in Europe right now. Does that relate at all to the anti-Jewish sentiment that was felt uh, in the early 20th century? I, th I think it's something totally different, because the anti-Jewish sentiment was against Jews that were citizens that were uh, living in these countries for hundreds of years. Whereas the current, anti, the current sentiment against uh, Arabs or Muslims in general are, is against those against immigrants, not those who were there for many years before. Those who are aware of it, I believe they do. They understand the situation. Uh, in particular, I remember there was one speech by a member of the Knesset, uh, Ahmed Tibi, who is an Arab, of course, who gave a speech a few years ago about the Holocaust. And it was said that this, this was the best speech ever in the Knesset about the Holocaust that was given. And it was by, by the Arab uh, member of the Knesset. And yet the Arabs of Israel, the Arab minority, has its problems with the Shoah because they know that the Shoah is instrumentalized against the Arabs, against the Palestinians, and they don't want to, to be a part of this game. So Israel's policy has to be also very cautious about it. Arabs in Israel try to understand also what happened in the Holocaust, but they are afraid of being used by this knowledge. There is an attempt, there was an attempt in Nazareth to have a museum, a Holocaust museum, an Arab Holocaust museum. And the reaction among the Jews in Israel was not very welcoming because we try to monopolize, we, the Jews of Israel, try to monopolize the memory of the Holocaust. So what should an Arab in Israel say when encountered with this kind of a reaction? What about uh, Israeli Jews that live here, especially people who are descendants of people who survived or fled the Holocaust? Do you think that they're sensitive enough to the uh, tragedy that Arab people here have experienced as a result of the creation of Israel? The overall number shows that the answer is negative. Most of the people in Israel do not care very much about the Arabs and about the way we handle the Arabs, both in the occupied territories and in Israel itself. There are groups which interpret their relation to the Arabs against the background of the Holocaust. Some of them say the lesson that we learned was we were persecuted during the Holocaust, we should never be persecuted, and this is why we should uh, be, go as far as persecuting even the Arabs. There is a totally different approach also among Israelis who say, we were the persecuted uh, minority, we should do everything in order not to do it ourselves to a minority, to another group which lives with us or among us. Unfortunately, this is, this is not the dominant issue yeah. among the Israeli society. What do you explain for that gap? What, what's the gap? Why is there a lack of empathy there? It's as if, it's almost as if uh, there is a thinking that we were the victims with, uh, we were prosecuted, hence we have almost the right to prosecute others in order to save ourselves and uh, prevent being persecuted again. Which is, of course, uh, I don't agree with it, but majority of the, it seems that the majority of the society uh, goes in this uh, way of thinking. 
Well, now to uh, Netanyahu, he often always uh, puts a link between Iran and the Holocaust. Do you think that's right? Well, this is a, exactly a case of instrumentalization in order to frighten the Israeli people, the Israeli public, in order to create this paranoia. The best way is to go and get from the arsenal of history the story of the Holocaust. And this comparison is, from the point of view of the, historians, un, of the historian, unfounded. But uh, politically, it is a clear case of instrumentalization and manipulation of history in order to achieve a political aim at the moment. Netanyahu's aim is to uh, get support for a strike against uh, Iran. His policy is a clearly anti-Iranian policy. He believes in it. He tries to get the uh, Israeli public behind him. And this is why he uses the Holocaust. It is a very effective instrument. We do know uh, that Iran has repeatedly denied the Holocaust what uh, Iran again? or Ahmadinejad in, par in particular? In particular. I am not sure that today is this is the official uh, stance of the Iranian government. I I'm, don't know, but I'm not sure that this is an official stance. So, what what is your take? I, why do you you think it's because Rouhani was uh, is now in power, and you think that? Uh, I mean, it does seem a bit vague. Yeah, seem, seems that things has, have changed somewhat. Mm -hmm. And despite the fact that Iran doesn't recognize uh, Israel um, as a state in the Middle East, uh, it still doesn't mean that it is going to, uh, to destruct Israel by force. There's a gap between not recognizing and uh, acting against. You address two issues, which are very different. The one is the issue of denial of the Holocaust. You have to fight against the denial of the Holocaust, because we know that the Holocaust took place, and we think that knowing about it is most important. And there is another thing, the threat of Iran uh, against Israel. If you combine both, then, of course, you uh, are trying to manipulate history in order to get or to uh, achieve a political aim. And uh, this is a kind of a confusion which is uh, not clear to everybody. Well, what is your take on Holocaust denial throughout the world? There is an attempt to do it, especially on the part of anti-Semites. Anti-Semites try to show, first of all, that the Jews are bad, and secondly, that the Jews were not as badly treated as they describe, which is the Holocaust couldn't have happened. Uh, but this is something which is, uh, uh, let's say, rather marginal in the culture of uh, Western civilizations. People know about the Holocaust, and most of the people know that it happened and are not going to deny the existence of the Holocaust. It is, of course, uh, the duty of everybody, not only of historians and politicians, to take care of the issue and try to show those who are blind that the Holocaust really took place. But this is not a major I issue anymore. We use it again as a kind of a manipulation in order to show that all the world is against us. I believe that Holocaust denial is, uh, is on the down, on the... Uh, not that we hear, we hear about it less and less, but on the other hand, we hear more and more about the Holocaust, about research, about new findings. Research and about the Holocaust seems to be very much on the rise throughout the world. Uh, not only research, also commemoration in many, many countries. Well, thank you so much for the insight. We really appreciate it. Right now, we're going to go for a uh, short break, and we will be right back with you. Thank you for joining us.